So when you have a fracture, folks, you have a, a breaking of the, con of the continuity of the bone, okay? Depending on where you have the fracture, uh, it lets you know how severe it's going to be because let's say if I fracture my, my finger, my phalanx, let's say I fracture that, right? Is it going to hurt? Yeah. Okay. But what else am I going to look at? What else is going to happen to my, my finger that fractured? It's, it's going to swell. Am I going to bleed a lot? No. Probably not because it's my finger. Okay, even if it's open, uh, even if it's an open fracture. How about if I fracture my femur? Yeah. Okay, it's gonna bleed a lot. It'll, it'll swell up, it's gonna hurt a lot. Um, but it's also gonna, I'm also gonna be bleeding because if you guys look on, the, um, on page 138, it shows you the vascularization of the actual femur, of the pelvic area. You see all that red there, all those arteries? It's highly vascularized. So when you actually break a bone, does it break off in a nice and uh, blunt manner? No, it's sometimes really sharp, right? That sharpness actually breaks the skin open. So it, al it also severs the, uh, the blood vessels. So aside from pain, aside from swelling, what else are we gonna look for? Bleeding. How can we know the patient's bleeding if the bone didn't come out of the body? Discoloration. Discoloration, okay, but what else? How do we know the patient's bleeding? They just nicked their femoral artery. Yeah. Huh? Check the Their vital signs. They're vital signs, okay, pulses included. So, the patient's bleeding out severely through this particular area, you're gonna have discoloration and all that. What are the vital signs looking like? What does the respirations look like? Fast, right? Tachypnea. What does your heart rate look like? Fast, okay. Tachycardia. What does your blood pressure look like? Low. Low, why? Because the circulating blood, meaning the blood inside the vessels, because the blood is no longer inside the vessels. The blood, the, when we assess the blood pressure, guys, it's the vessels that we're assessing, right? So now the blood's all over the, the rest of the body in the tissue, but it's no longer inside the blood vessels. So your blood pressure goes down and your body compensates. So it goes tachycardic, tachypnic, so it can actually push all that little bit of volume of blood throughout the rest of the body and the rest of the tissues. So understand that's your signs and symptoms of shock as well, okay? You're also gonna have one more, deformity, okay? If I break my, uh, my femur, if the fracture went all the way through, now I have these two bones right here. Um, this might happen, look. Okay, it's very painful, and it's gonna deform the leg. What's my leg gonna look like if this is what happened to my femur? It's gonna be shorter, okay? Um, do you think it's gonna be going outward or inward? Outward. outward. When you guys walk, typically, where does your leg wanna go? You guys remember being in junior high, you want to walk like cool like this? I remember this as a kid, I, don't, I always want to walk like this. As you get older, you get dorkier the way you walk. Your, ha your feet kind of stick outward. That's the natural tendency of your leg. That's where it wants to go. So you're going to notice that it's uh, a little shorter. Blood pressure is going to be down, tachycardia, tachypnic. And there's going to be a deformity to the leg, whether it's shorter or, to the, or, or it's called uh, external rotation. Okay, so keep that in mind, all right? All right, fractures of the hip. Now, some diagnostic tests, of course, uh, x-rays, uh, hemoglobin as well, because if you're bleeding, your hemoglobin's gonna go down, right? Uh, medical management for um, a nursing intervention for, for, for fractures of the hip. You have two basic um, ways that we're, gonna, that we're gonna try to relieve the pressure of that bone. Okay, there's two things that we're gonna use. One of them is called the Buck's traction, and the other one's called the Russell's traction. You guys look at your little illustration that I gave you guys, right here in the, in the front. It shows you a little illustration of each. Okay, you guys see the, the guy on the top? Okay, what do you think fractured with that guy? Yeah, the hip, the hip. So the legs are folded and he's got pins drilled into his knee, most likely, okay? Or on the lateral and medial aspect of it and they're keeping tension on the, on the femur, on that part of the leg. And instead of it being like this, now they've done this. Does that make sense? It's very painful, yeah. Why that's so uncomfortable? Is he kind of Yeah, that patient, it, it's just a funny picture. Normally they don't look like that. His hips aren't all the way up there like that. <laughs> okay, they're also not naked like that, but it's just, <laughs> I found it on Google. Okay, 
But the whole purpose of, uh, of these traction devices, your Bucks and your Russells, and I'll describe the difference in a little bit, is that they, they apply tension, okay, to the leg. They pull the leg, so when the fracture is touching itself like this, it's very painful, right? You have all the nerve endings. But when you have the Bucks or the Russells traction, it pulls the leg, and now it, it uh, maintains stability. Does that make sense? Okay, this is what actually is actually happening. You have the femur that my whole, my both my arms, my forearms are the femur. It broke. Now it's like this, because you have a lot of muscle there, a lot of ligaments, so it's pulling it in, right? The Buck and Russell's traction, it pulls it out, and it keeps it like that. Now, how does it maintain it separated like that? Yeah, usually with uh, some type of pulley or a weight that's attached to the end of that particular device. You guys notice on the illustration right here. A little bag, a sack of something. Okay, that's usually a bag of sand. Okay, a little sack of sand is about 10, 15 pounds, just enough to maintain tension. Okay, and to fixate or immobilize a specific limb. So when it comes, I want you guys to write down for Bucks and Russells, they're the same thing. The main difference is that Russells has a sling underneath the uh, the popliteal area. Okay, underneath the popliteal area. Yeah, Bucks and Russell's traction guys are the same thing. The main difference is that Russell's has a sling under the popliteal area like this that holds the leg up. That's the main difference. Notice how Bucks extension traction, the bone in the bottom. Okay, that one doesn't have a sling. The leg is just flat on the on the bed. And you have a little weight at the bottom. Do you guys see that? Okay, so that's keeping it not uh, having both bones compressed. When you have a uh, Russell's traction, it has a little sling underneath that particular uh, popliteal area, and the, le the leg's a little more elevated. That's the main difference between those two. Know the difference between those two. Okay? You can use it for both hip fractures and also for femoral fractures. We can also have surgical repair, something called internal fixation, uh, knuffled nail and screws, or the Kuntner nail. You'll find that on page 138. It shows you the different types of nails that we actually drill inside the bone. We hammer it inside, and then we fuse them together. And through time, it calcifies and everything. It ossifies. It gets hardened, and it stays in there. But that's, how, that's another surgical intervention. Please know those two types of pins. Know the names. The, the new fold is uh, the illustration A on page 138, the bottom right hand corner. And the Kunstner, uh, the, the, the Kunstner is your B illustration. It goes all straight down through the femur area that holds both places, both parts of the bones intact. You guys know what internal fixation means? Yeah, internal is inside. So if you have a, fra if you have a fracture, what we do is we put, we open up the skin and we put pins that actually hold all the fragments of the bones in place. That's what uh, internal fixation is. You guys know what fixation means? Fixation. Okay, you guys, girls, you guys remember being in junior high, be, being fixated with that one guy? Okay, when you're stuck on something, you're obsessing over it? Okay, so, a little similar with fixation. Fixation means it's stuck. We're immobilizing it. Okay, that's what fixation means. So internal fixation. We also have something called external fixation. You guys know what external fixation is? We're fixating the bone, meaning immobilizing the bone, but not through means of going inside. We're doing it through the outside. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, another way to um, manage a fractured uh, hip or femur would be a prosthetic implant, something called an Austin Moore prosthesis or a bipolar hip replacement. It just depends on what we need. You guys see that I'm going off the PowerPoint, right? What I'm reading right now. On that first box on page 11. So again, folks, what's the main difference between your Russells and your Bucks? Russells has a sling. Russells has a sling underneath the, under, underneath the knee, or the popliteal area. Now, what do Bucks and Russell's uh, tractions do? It keeps tension on the leg, okay? Or actually, it relieves tension. It keeps tension in another mechanism, but it actually separates the bones, and it keeps them fixated, okay? So 
box would be the same thing just without the slang. The little illustration on the packet that I gave you guys. This bottom illustration. It separates the bone? Yeah, it separates the bone. So when you have a fracture, if you guys look on page on the little packet that I gave you guys for illustrations, on the, the third page, or the third section of this one right here, the one with the baby arm, You notice how the lower portion of the, what bone is that, by the way? What bone is this? Humerus? Yeah, it's a humerus, okay? This particular one is a humerus. So when it's fractured, guys, it's riding up onto, it, uh, onto itself. So when you have a traction device, all it does is it pulls them apart and it keeps them steady and it fixates them. Okay, when you do this, it decreases, it decreases the pain, it decreases further damage to the tissue surrounding it, okay, and it immobilizes it. All right, so some post-operative interventions on the next slide. You guys see where I'm at? It's going to be wound and drain, uh, and drain assessment. What are you gonna, what's gonna let you know that it's infected? The color of the drainage, what's it gonna look like? Yellow, purulent drainage, yeah. Is it gonna be foul smelling? Yeah. Probably. Okay, you're gonna be assessing vital signs. Again, incentive spirometer and turning every two hours. Anti-embolic stockings, xantine coagulation therapy, maintain leg abduction again. Uh, limit weight bearing on the affected side. Very different from arthroplasty, right guys? Ladies, I'm right here. On um, page 11 of the, of the PowerPoint. I'm on slide 43. I don't know if you guys can see that. Oh, sorry, slide 42. Now, I was talking about when you have some type of arthroplasty, okay, or joint surgery, right? Um, it says you want to maintain, uh, you want to start ambulating the patient three to four hours after surgery, right? When you have a hip fracture though, okay, this is a little different, this is more severe, so you don't want to put any weight bearing, any weight on that specific uh, limb. Does that make sense? Uh, you you want to have chairs and uh, commode seats, and they should be raised uh, to prevent flexion of the hip beyond 60 degrees. You guys remember we talking about that last time? Okay, if you have a fracture right here, you don't want to flex too much. So you want to make sure that the bedside commodes are nice and high so you can literally just kind of sit on top of it. We have something called an ORIF, Open Reduction Internal Fixation. On the next slide, you guys see where I'm at? Mm -hmm. Okay, when you have an open reduction, what do you think that means? When you have opening, means you open actually, you actually open the skin. So you have, you open the skin and you reduce it, meaning you get the bones and you physically maneuver them, manipulate them so they can be fixated now. So open reduction and then you internally fixate them, meaning you get the pins and you screw them inside, the physician goes inside and he immobilizes the bones. That's what the O-R-I-F means. Okay. So you want to make sure that the patient uh, understands what the procedure is. You want to make sure that the patient can um, be assisted to dangle at the bedside. No weight on operative side. You want to turn every two hours. You want to maintain abduction again. Uh, physical therapy we ins will instruct to am uh, as to ambulation and weight bearing. And as patient progresses, encourage continuing ambulation only with assistance. So again, do you guys know what the ORIF stands for? Open yeah, so if, we, if I had a fracture of my leg, let's say, and it's in little pieces, now we can't really fix that by the outside. So I'm going to have surgery. They're going to open my leg. They're going to get little pins and make sure that they fixate or they put the bones pieces back together. Okay? That's what's going to end up happening. And sometimes they close the, the wound and the pins are still sticking out. Have you guys ever had some type of surgery where they put pins inside? Or your parents? Mm -hmm. What happened to you? Mm -hmm. Your ankle? Are they still in there? Yeah. Okay. My mom had surgical procedures well on her cervical spine. Okay. And they put a little plate with two screws inside as well to fuse the actual bones because they were getting a little too loose. Okay. That's called uh, open reduction internal fixation.
So anytime you guys see that terminology, the O-R-I-F, we're opening the patient. So what things are you going to be concerned with? Infection, bleeding. Okay, essentially that's going to be it. Um, the next slide, slide 44. Again, you want to avoid hip flexion beyond 60 degrees for approximately 10 days. Uh, beyond 90 degrees for two to three months. You want to avoid adduction of the affected leg beyond the midline for two to three months. What does that mean, beyond the midline? Yeah. Right here? So I'm going to prevent doing this. Okay, this is, this is adduction beyond the midline, my midline point. Okay. You want to maintain partial weight bearing for approximately two to three months and avoid positioning on the operative side. That's really important for you guys to know. If the, my surgical procedure was done here on my right hip, you don't want to put the patient on that specific side. All right, let's go to page 142 on your book. And it talks about other fractures. You see how on page 143 it, it illustrates all these different types of fractures? Okay, before we, before we move on, highlight the following. Uh, know your open or compound one. Page on page 143. Yeah, page 143. <clears throat> so again, know your open or compound fracture, know your comminuted or fragmented, uh, know your, um, the green stick, you guys see that one? Mm -hmm. On page 143, right there. Yeah, the green stick's really important, guys, because usually children suffer this fracture. You guys ever, um, you guys ever seen a two-year-old with a broken leg or anything like that? Mm -hmm. No, right? Because it's very uncommon because their bones are palliable. You guys know what palliable is? No, yeah, you can actually do this to the bone. I mean, I was going to say, I've done it to my kid, but I haven't. Um, yeah, that's on, on, on the green stick one. I'm, I'm just talking right now. You'll see it if you guys, when I, when I actually go through it. The reason why green stick is so important, guys, is because as nurses, if we work in the ER, and we have a patient come in, and they bring in the two-year-old child, and they have a fracture of the limb, that's, that's a red flag. You guys know for what? Yeah, for child abuse. You guys hear about the guy that um, he and his wife brought in their kid, and he, the kid had a fracture in his tibia. They arrested the dad, and they kept him in jail for about three weeks before they realized that the, bo that the boy had a genetic disorder and where he cannot, um, um, he had pathological fractures going on. So that wasn't the only fracture he had, but they thought that the father was abusing the child because, again, children's bones are, pa are palliable. Meaning if I grab the bone, I can actually do this and it'll bend. It won't break just yet. So when a child has a fracture, it didn't happen from them falling on their hand or falling on their foot. It happened from the parent being pissed off and actually breaking it. Like literally? It could happen literally breaking it or grabbing the child's arm if they're pissed off and like picking them up real hard. Yeah. They'll also break it. Okay, so if you guys ever see that, that's what it means. It's going to be under test. So green stick is specific for child, uh, chil children frac child fractures. Notice how the fracture didn't go all the way, mm -hmm. okay? All right, so again, guys, know your open or compound, your com uh, communi communicated, know your green stick. Those are really important for you guys to know. All right, let's talk about all these types of fractures. Again, a traumatic injury to the bone in which the continuity of a tissue of the bone is broken. Um, it could be pathological or spontaneous fractures. You guys know what pathological means? Something going, uh, it's something that's diseased, right? So the issue would be like that father I told you guys that was thrown in jail for about two to three weeks while they investigated the whole issue. The kid had an abnormality. I mean, he, he uh, it was a boy. He had pathological fractures, meaning he would have, his bones would break without there being any physical trauma. So like literally by walking around, his leg would just break. Okay, from being in bed for too long, the child's leg would break. Okay, so that's pathological. Traumatic would be, of course, um, the other types.
Uh, types of fractures, guys. You have open, closed, green stick, complete, comminuted, uh, impacted, transverse, oblique, spiral, and uh, Coley's or Potts uh, fractures as well. When it comes to Coley's or Potts, um, I'm not going to test you on them, but the specific incomplete fractures that I'll talk about in a little bit again. Clinical manifestations, of course, are going to include a pain, loss of normal function, obvious deformity is the big one. Please highlight that, obvious deformity. Change in the curvature of length of the bone. Uh, crepitus, we know what crepitus is? You guys know what crepitus is? All right, crepitus, guys, is a, is a noise and a sensation that we feel when the bones are broken, okay? It's like a little popping noise, uh, the grinding noise of all the bones gritting together. That's crepitus. You'll have soft tissue edema, warmth over the injured area, ecchymosis of skin and surrounding injured area, and loss of sensation to the distal injury. That's really important. If I fracture my ankle, okay, if I fracture my ankle, it says loss of sensation to the distal area. So is it going to be here? Is it excuse me, it's going to be here. Yeah, my foot, because this is still distal, okay? It essentially means this, I broke my ankle, the nerve endings were probably severed, so now I don't have a uh, sensation to my toes, okay, or anywhere beyond that point. Does that make sense? And again, how do we diagnose any fracture? X-rays. All right, please pay attention to this medical management. Um, the first thing we do is we want to immobilize or splint Okay, so if you find somebody that has a potential fractured elbow, arm, foot, anything, the first thing we want to do is immobilize it and we want to elevate the extremity. Immobilize and elevate. Write that down. Immobilize and elevate. And we're going to splint the area to uh, prevent edema. Talks about body alignment, but if you guys have a patient that fractures, uh, like say their arm, you don't want to pop it back into place just yet. We want to take an x-ray first and then make sure that we don't actually sever any blood vessels. Uh, you want to elevate the arm or the body part. Application of cold packs for the first 24 hours. Of course you want to administer analgesics. Assess for change in color, sensation, and temperature, and observe for signs of shock. How would you assess a patient's hand if they're, let's say, the radius and their ulnar, and their ulnar broke, right? How would you assess for sensation? Which one? What? Uh, sensation, guys. You want to ask them if they feel this. Can you feel this? Okay. The reason why I know it's very basic, guys, but I'm testing you on this stuff, so know, know that example. How do we assess circulation? Capillary, Capillary refill. Okay. That's right. And then we also want to ask the patient if they can move their hands, because if they can move their hands, that means that the fracture probably isn't that severe. Or maybe they don't have a fracture at all. I told you guys about my son spraining his ankle. Okay, the first thing I asked him after, uh, after he stopped crying was, can you move your toes? And he was like, no. And so I got worried, but he was just being a sissy. Um, <laughs> a little while after, we gave him some ibuprofen, he moved his toes. Now, could there be any movement of the toes if there was a fracture where, nerve involved, where the nerves were severed? No. So either A, it's fractured, but the nerves are intact, or there's no fracture at all. Okay, so make sure you know how to assess your capillary refill and your neurological sensation. Um, what's the normal capillary refill? Three less than three seconds, okay? Three seconds or less, I mean. All right. All right, there's uh, other types of fractures. Uh, you have your closed or your simple fracture. Anybody in here had a, had a fracture of a bone, aside from Mr. Leo? Okay, what did you break, Miss? Uh, what did you break? Is that it? <laughs> How'd you break your finger? Uh -huh. And when I fell, I felt like this, and I cracked it right here. Oh, wow. Did they, did they put your hand in? Uh, did they do uh, an yeah, open, open reduction? Yeah. They do open reduction? Yeah. They okay. Okay, so is that open, internal, or external uh, external. reduction? External. external, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, so your close would be a uh, closed reduction, uh, immobilization, traction device if needed. Again, which type of traction devices do we have? 
Which ones, guys? Bucks and, Bucks and Russells. Russells. What's the difference between Russells and Bucks? Russell has a sling under the knee. Okay. Now, now, here's another question for you guys. If I have Russell's traction and I have a sling under my leg, okay, what is that going to predispose me to? If I have a sling under my leg, my leg's putting pressure on that sling, right? There's pressure on that particular part of my body. What might you want to assess to make sure it's not compromised? Circulation. Yeah, circulation. Okay, that's, an, that's a test question, okay guys? That's a test question, so make sure you keep that in mind. Okay, so again, you can have a closed reduction, uh, immobilization traction, or you can have an open reduction. Open means we have surgical procedure now with internal fixation device. What's an internal fi fixation device? Pins. It's pins. Yeah, pins. And then we can have an open one. Now, if we have an open fracture, what disease or what type of uh, infection can we get? What's it called? What's it called? Osteomyelitis. Okay, and osteomyelitis is caused by staph. All right. So when you have an open or a compound fracture, you might have a surgical debridement and culture of the wound to make sure that there's no osteomyelitis. You might have administration of tetanus toxoid that I spoke about before as well. You guys remember that? Okay, the tetanus shot? Yeah. They call it toxoid because it's a, it's a, um, it's a vaccination for it. Uh, observe for signs of infection. Now, describe some signs of infection for me. What was it? Inflammation. You guys know what rubber is? Yeah. It's redness. You guys ever seen an infection and there's like a red darkening around the rim of the, s of the wound or something like that? Yeah. That's rubber. Very heightened red. Redness. Okay. Um, you're going to have fever. What's your, what, blood, what blood counts are going to be elevated? Y blood cells. Okay. Okay. You might, uh, we're going to, of course, do closure of the wound and then reduction and immobilization of the fracture. You guys know what it means by reduction? When we reduce a fracture? So if I have a fracture, we're reducing it. That's reducing it, okay? That's what reduction is. We're putting it back to its uh, natural alignment. You guys can follow along also on page 145 on fracture of the vertebrae. But I'm going off of this, okay? So when we were doing the neurovascular system, guys, neuro, back in AMP, what does your, what does your vertebral column do? What, is your, what, are your, what does your vertebrae do? It sends information and receives information, right? You guys remember that? Yeah. Okay, so if I, um, if I fracture a certain part of my vertebral column that sends information to my hands, in okay, case sensation, let's say, what happens when I break that bone? What happens when I break that bone, guys? Yeah, you lose sensation. So keep that in mind when we're, when we're discussing these things. Okay, so it could be uh, because of a diving accident. Did I show you guys the movie Mar Adentro? Yes, the guy that took a dive, he dove in, hit his head. All right, so diving accidents, blows to the head or body, um, osteoporosis. What's osteoporosis? Bone density. Okay, loss of bone density. Um, uh, metastatic cancer, motorcycle or car accidents, displaced fracture, maybe uh, may place pressure on or sever the actual spinal uh, cord nerves. So the clinical manifestations would be, of course, a pain at site of injury, partial or complete loss of mobility or sensation. Uh, evidence of fracture, uh, dislocation on x-rays. Um, so medical management is going to include uh, to, s to stabilize the injury. Oh, no, stable injuries. Okay, so what's the difference between your stable and unstable injuries of the vertebral column? Well, stable would mean this. The patient's still okay. They're still breathing okay. The vital signs are still normal. That's a stable stable injury, okay? Unstable meaning this patient's coding. They're bleeding too much. Their, their, uh, their phrenic nerve was involved. You guys remember what your phrenic nerve does? Okay, it controls your diaphragm. You guys remember what your diaphragm does? It helps you breathe. So, if you damage your phrenic nerve, which controls your ability to breathe, what's going to happen to you? You're not going to breathe. You might die. Okay. 
So with stable injuries, you want to have a pain management, muscle relaxants, uh, back support, brace, or cast. And for unstable fractures, you can do a traction and open reduction. How would you apply traction, guys, to your vertebral column? How would you do that? Remember, with the femur, we do this, right? We could do the Bucks or Russell's traction. How would we do it to the vertebral column? The halo thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be the halo thing. So essentially, we get prongs and we screw them into the sc into the skull, and then we have the same little pulley that holds pressure with your traction with your Russell's and Bucks, except on your head, and it pulls your your neck out, back up, and it actually maintains traction that way. Okay, that's how we relieve the tension. And if you guys go to page 146, it shows you a little illustration of that. You guys see it? Now, real quick, if you have um, the halo traction, what are you going to be concerned about? If you have, um, if you actually have pins going inside the head? Infection, yeah, infection. Okay. It talks about on medical management. I think it's right there, but it talks about um, how you maintain a good integrity or proper integrity of the actual pins of the halo. Do you guys know how you would do that? What type of chemicals would we use? You want to use alcohol? No. Why not? It dries it out. It also burns a lot, right? You'd want to use um, normal saline and what else? Hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Make sure you make note of that, guys. Hydrogen peroxide and normal saline. Also, at any point, do we adjust the weight of the, of the actual traction devices? Yeah? No. Let's think about this. If you have the, fra let's, say, let's talk about the femur real quick. You have the femoral bone, right? We've uh, fixated it. We've reduced it. And the only reason we reduce it is because we have those 15 pounds on that sling. Okay, on the, on the, on the rope, right? So if we reduce the tension, what's gonna happen to that bone? going to write back up. Same thing with the, with the vertebral column, okay guys? So at no time do we ever relieve, uh, we, do we actually mess around with the, with the weights of the actual traction. And if you have a patient that's on a halo, guys, again, we want to maintain body alignment. If you have to reposition them because they had a bowel movement, how do you reposition them on their side? You yeah, you log roll them. Okay, and it talks about that on page 146. Under nursing intervention and patient teachings, it says on that number one, log rolling the patient for position changes is crucial. Okay. It says following the correct procedure of turning a patient in a, spine, in a special bed such as a, a striker frame or foster bed, elevating the head of the bed no more than 30 degrees is also really important. What happens if, the, if a pin comes out? What do you do? If you're there, let's say you're there right now, and you just learned this, and your patient's pin actually unscrewed a little bit, what do you do? You call the doctor. Yeah, you don't try to put it back in there. You don't, you don't like cover it up or anything like that. You call the physician. Okay, you let the physician know. Okay, how would you know it's in, how would you know it's infected? Redness, foul smelling odor. Okay. And again, how do you clean it? With NSM. Okay, I don't know what you guys said, but saline and hydrogen peroxide. All right, let's talk about fractures of the pelvis. Fractures of the pelvis, guys, are really important. It's one of the most common fractures that we have, especially for the older population. Uh, it can be caused by falls, automobile accidents, or crushing accidents. Um, again, is this patient going to bleed out a lot? Why? A lot of blood vessels there. That's right. And so some clinical manifestations include uh, unable to bear weight without discomfort, uh, pelvic tenderness and edema, and signs of shock. Again, because it's highly vascularized. And again, what are your signs of shock, guys? Blood pressure is? Low. Heart rate and respirations are? High. Okay. Uh, is the patient sweaty? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they're sweaty. All right. Uh, medical management for this one is going to be bed rest. Uh, more severe fractures may require surgery and or a, a spica or a body cast. You guys know what a spica or spica is? It's a body cast, 
that is literally from here down to there. And sometimes they, uh, depending on what other lib is broken, they can have, like your arm was fractured as well. They can even attach your arm to it. Okay, so you won't be, you'll be all immobilized. For, but this one's gonna be from the actual, about mid torso down to immobilize the hip and everything that's adjacent to it. All right, so every time we have a fracture, guys, we swell, right? The patient's gonna swell up. There's gonna be uh, inflammation, uh, deformity of the limb. But something that happens to the tissue, it swells so much sometimes, and if we don't do anything about it, we develop something called compartment syndrome, okay? You have to know what compartment syndrome is. Compartment syndrome is essentially my arm. Okay, I fractured it, but I'm not doing anything about it, or the inflammation gets so bad that it actually swells so much that all my blood vessels in my arm are no longer perfusing because it's so tight. Does that make sense? So what's going to happen? What was that? Yeah, lots of blood flow. Okay. So how do we take care of that? I'll talk about it right now. So again, compartment syndrome, the cause is a progressive development of arterial vessel uh, compression and reduced blood supply to an extremity. Clinical manifestations include sharp pain with movement, numbness or tingling, also known as paresthesia, in the affected extremity, cool and pale or cyanotic, and slow capillary refill. Slow means greater than how many seconds? Three. Okay, good. Or more, greater than three seconds. Medical management is something called a fasciotomy. Okay, you guys have to know that a fasciotomy Okay, it's an incision, an incision into the fascia. So what we're doing, guys, if you look at this little illustration of the poor little baby, you guys see that? Yeah. So you guys have that illustration. I think you have one more. What's wrong with the baby? That's actually a burn, guys, but okay. <laughs> but, it, but that's what it looks like, though. When it's really swollen, it looks like that. Notice how it's becoming black, okay? You think there's vascularization going there? Perfusion to the skin? No. So go back a page and you'll see this illustration right here, okay? That one's a little deeper than what I uh, was looking for, but essentially that's what happens. That's a fasciotomy, guys. That, that's an actual injury for the patient. But it's the, it's the oh, who, 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 who that? That happened to your dad? Yeah, like they did it up here on his arm and they did it right here. Okay. So essentially what happens is, with your dad, he got electric here, so everything was getting swollen. Compressing blood vessels, so we need to relieve that tension. How do we relieve it? You get that scalpel and you cut and you open. It relieves the pressure. Okay, so that's called a fasciotomy. The fascia, guys, is a layer of tissue that that separates your internal organs from the surface of the internal part of the of the dermis. So if we think about the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous tissue. Okay, it's right beneath that. Okay, so please know that fasciotomy. We go ahead and we open the patient's uh, leg or arm and we reduce the tension. If you guys go to the next slide, you have a couple of more illustrations of that as well. If you have a fasciotomy, what are your concerns? What are you going to be looking out for? Infection. Infection. Bleeding. All right, let's talk about some complications of fractures. Uh, the patient can go into shock. Different causes would be blood loss, uh, pain, or fear. What's the example for shock of fear? What happens to you? If you're so, yeah, you faint. Essentially, that's what's happening. Okay, with the pain, you have so much pain that you pass out. And with shock, is, uh, with uh, blood, is you, your hypovolemic shock. Signs and symptoms, of course, altered level of consciousness or ALOC, uh, restlessness, hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, pale, cool, uh, moist skin. Medical management is gonna include uh, restore blood volume, uh, you provide shock trousers. You guys know what shock trousers are? Okay, they're essentially these pants that you put on and they get, uh, they're either already really tight on you or they get compressed with air and it, may, it constricts your legs and it keeps all the blood flowing in your vital organs. Okay, that's what the shock trousers are. Oh, and then of course oxygen. If you have a fracture uh, and you nick Let's say you have it, um, say you fracture your rib. Okay, it breaks and it nicks, it, it, it cuts off a chunk of fat. What happens is that fat goes into your bloodstream. You have something called the fat embolism or a fat emboli, which is the next thing. 
the cause is um, emo embolization of fat tissue with platelets, meaning your platelets and the fat travel together in your bloodstream and then they become lodged somewhere, usually in your lungs. Yeah, yeah in your lungs. So what's the whole purpose of the lungs? To, to breathe, to exchange oxygen and CO2. So if it gets stuck there, it's like traffic congestion in the highway, okay? Signs and symptoms include uh, irritability, restlessness, disorientation, stupor, coma, chest pain, and dyspnea. Uh, you will have sharp chest pain. You'll also have something called um, hemoptysis. You guys know what hemoptysis is? You're spinning up blood. Medical interventions can include IV fluids, uh, steroids, the joxin. You guys know what the joxin is? Uh, highlight the joxin. This is one of those medications that you're going to have to know for the rest of your life. The joxin is a medication, also known as lenoxin. Okay. It's on page 14 on uh, slide 55 under medical management. So again, we give IV fluid, steroids, and the joxin. The joxin is a medication that decreases your heart rate, but it makes your stroke more efficient. So if my heart rate right now is like, let's say, 72, right? So it's like, dum -dum, dum -dum, dum -dum. if I give myself the joxin, it's going to slow down my heart rate, but it's going to make my stroke really efficient. So, dum -dum, dum -dum. so it maximizes your cardiac output. A couple of considerations when giving the joxin there, okay? Um, you want to make sure that the patient's heart rate is no less than 60 uh, per minute. And for the joxin, you always assess the apical pulse for a full minute. After giving it? Or? No, before, before giving it, before giving it. Because it's a, it, what, what does it do again? It decreases the heart rate, but it just makes your stroke more efficient, right? So you would give it to somebody that has a high heart rate, that has a high heart rate and they're not perfusing blood adequately. So um, Ms. Lee had talked about this. Ms. Lee has her husband. Her husband had a, a congestive heart failure. His heart wasn't pumping as it was supposed to be pumping. So what did they do? She demanded that the physician give him the joxin, Dig. Finally, they gave it to her husband and the patient and her husband's uh, blood supply just got a lot better and his heart rate came down as well. The problem is if you give this medication and the heart rate is less than 60, what's going to happen to the patient? He's going to bottom out. He might die. Okay, he's going to bottom out. So you always make sure that it's above 60. Does that make sense? So for um, decreases your heart rate, so it makes your... Your stroke more efficient. It, it, make it, it, it allows your heart to pump better. It increases the cardiac output. Now, for any time, uh, any time a patient is undergoing the Johnson therapy or they, they have it prescribed to them, you also want to assess for the Johnson toxicity, meaning you have too much. Now, what do you think happens when you have too much the Johnson? What's going to happen to your heart rate? It's going to go lower, 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 and then you're going to die. So essentially, the joxin toxicity is going to also include a headache. Okay, it's going to include a little bit of vertigo, and it's also going to include uh, bradycardia, your heart rate that's less than 60. That's the joxin toxicity. So any questions on the joxin? Do you know why we're giving it for a fat embolism? Anybody? To stop the flow? To stop the flow? Okay, you're on the, not, you don't want to stop it, but to, you're, you're, you're uh, Essentially, guys, when we have a fat embolism, we have a clot that's stuck somewhere in our lungs, usually in the higher part of our lungs, right? So we can't get any oxygen in. The cool thing about the joxin is, oh, well, first of all, if your body's trying to compensate that, what's the heart rate going to do? It's going to go fast, right? It's going to go really fast. Is it still pumping effectively? No. No. We give the joxin because, again, it slows it down, but it makes your stroke a lot more efficient. So, so it, it maximizes how much O2 it actually obstructs, uh, it gets from the lungs. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to think about it, sort of. Yeah. It does, but it does it chemically. It does it chemically, okay? So it brings down the heart rate, but it makes your stroke a lot more efficient. But it doesn't get Excuse me? Of the fat embolism? No, but this is what's happening. So that's why I asked why, why do we do that. When you have a fat embolism, your heart's working so hard. It's working so hard. 
but the Joxon helps it because first of all it's going to slow it down but it's going to make the stroke more efficient so it's not going to have to keep pumping so hard and not even pumping adequately so when you give the Joxon it slows it down which is good you don't want you, you to be tachycardic but the stroke is more efficient so now it's getting all that blood oxygen that oxygenated blood without the high heart rate or it maximizes its potential yeah we need to get something else to get rid of the fat embolism. what do we get Yeah, you give something called uh, thromboelytic or, or clot busters. Yeah, that's what we do. Okay, you also give them oxygen and stuff like that. Okay, so any questions on the fat embolism? What is it? We have a fracture, uh, the fat dislodges, it goes, it travels through our circulation, it goes, it, it gets wedged up inside the lungs, we give the joxin, the joxin decreases blood heart rate, makes us stroke more efficient. Make sense? All right, guys, go to lunch, come back at one o'clock.